chapter 2. In, as things develop, we are really focusing our attention upon the concepts of verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I want to focus attention upon the three words, devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly. Two of them basically describe the ministry of Paul and his associates. The third one assesses the ministry of Paul and his associates. And this is important to us. Os Ganes has a new book out called A Free People's Suicide. He puts the question to the reader, how does a free country sustain its freedom. He starts off by saying that their freedom can be looked at in two segments, or three segments. Segment number one are those people who have secured the freedom. Segment number two, those people who will organize the freedom. And segment number three, those who will sustain the freedom. Usually those who secure the freedom are the ones who get the attention and the glory. But how one organizes the freedom is really critical. He points out, for example, the freedom gained in the revolution in China really didn't turn out to be much freedom at all, did it, the way it was organized. And what is even more important is the group of people who know how to maintain that organized freedom so that they can sustain the free life. And it takes at least five areas of concern. Area number one, a country that has elected leaders without character is in trouble. Number two, a country that has an economic system without values and trust is in real trouble. Number three, a country that sustains scientific development without human values is in trouble. Number four, Freedom without virtue is troublesome. And number five, negative freedom without positive freedom is troublesome. Which one of those five areas has America successfully dealt with? And those who fail in all five areas do not have a good future for sustaining freedom. In my response to as far as I've read, you see the importance of the Christian faith beyond just our own gathering together as brothers and sisters, encouraging one another, and all else that we do as a part of the body of Christ. Because the Christian faith, when we are walking with the Lord as we should, develops character. And in developing character, there is a highly prized conduct. And this is what interests me about that 10th verse. Paul says to his readers, you are witnesses. 
and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we have behaved toward you believers. Proper conduct is one of the basic components to the bond of faith. That's the way it would read to us as believers. But notice there should be value that goes beyond the family of God. First, there is the devout conduct. Secondly, there is the righteous conduct. And thirdly, there is the blameless conduct. The devout conduct describes the character of the person. So also does the righteous conduct. The blameless conduct, logically, is a result of the first two. Or, to put it differently, the first two are descriptors, and the third one is one that values. Let's look at these. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Devout conduct speaks primarily of being devoted to God, as we would read in the sixth verse. Notice that when one comes to faith in Christ, and this is a right relationship with Christ, and it is not merely a formal matter within the mind and within the society, there is a burning desire to be like the Lord. You also became imitators of us, and of the Lord. And notice that the consequence of receiving that gospel, in receiving it, they received the word in much tribulation and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. There will be consequences to coming to faith. And in this age, those consequences are not always good. But it is the greatest value Notice that coming to faith and having a reason for living that goes beyond oneself is more valuable than the tribulation generated by their confession of faith. And notice it is the source of greatest joy. We find it to be true that sometimes in our most troublesome times, there still is the ring of joy in our minds because the, the two sources of joy, the one that we could find in our time and the one that is timeless from the Lord, the first one will come and go. The second one is always there. And it should fairly well be said of us that while we may not be clicking our heels together filled with exuberant joy as we go down the street because of the circumstances of life, there still is more than a flicker of joy in our hearts. And notice that to be imitators of the one is to be imitators of the Lord. And this is a part of devout conduct. There is a devotion to the Lord. And there is a devotion to serving the Lord. In verse 4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. This is a part of our Christian walk. We are devoted to God. We are devoted to the Lord in a personal relationship, but that personal relationship will always show it itself in serving the Lord. Notice that they had been entrusted with the gospel. Remember on Sunday morning as I, we've been working through 2 Timothy, when Paul speaks of being convinced, he knows in whom he has believed, and that God will guard that which has been entrusted to him. And then Paul speaks to Timothy about that which has been entrusted to Timothy. Trust is a relationship. We have entrusted our lives to the Lord, and the Lord has entrusted us with that tremendous treasure called the gospel, to be shared and to be lived. 
and there is no real devotion to the Lord apart from devout serving the Lord as well. And notice the standard. The standard is high, but the standard is good. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. In the end, the standards of God always stay the same. The standards of men can rise, can fall, can be modified, but the standards of God are always the same, and we know those standards. And he examines our hearts. As we've pointed out many times in 1 Corinthians 4.2, it is required of stewards, it's required of fiduciaries to be found faithful. And Paul goes on to say, and what difference does it make, Furrow's paraphrased version, what difference does it make what you think of me? What really counts is what the Lord thinks of me. And we're to remain faithful until that day when the Lord calls us into count and he lays bare the hidden things of our hearts. So in the end, devotion is to the Lord and for his glory. And we are answerable to him and to him alone, and in the end, he is the one whom we serve. But notice this devotion to God will show itself not only in being devoted to serving the Lord, but also a devotion to serving others. For in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, notice that we read, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Make it a practice to encourage one another. There probably is not a person in here who at one time or another appreciated the encouragement that somebody else gave to you. Whether we asked for it or whether it just seemed to come spontaneously, encouragement is encouragement. And it is a part of our responsibility as the writer to Hebrews says in chapter 10, to encourage one another to love and good deeds. And notice that is one of the reasons why we should be in attendance regularly, not because the spirit-filled, fire-baptized sermons that come from the pulpit. Those you may have to put up with. But what is in our hands as individuals is that we are not to forsake the assembling together as is the custom of some, why? Not because of the sermons exclusively, but also we have a ministry to perform when we come together, and that ministry is to encourage one another to love and good deeds. And it would seem, thinking about it, that the best job and the easiest job is to go about encouraging one another to love and good deeds until you come across somebody who's been sucking on a green persimmon for the last three weeks. And they don't particularly care to be encouraged. They particularly care about wallowing in what hurts. And sometimes they have just plain run out of gas. It's not bad attitude. It's just that there is the drain. And we need to be there for one another. And notice that Paul, what Paul says, just as you are also doing. And notice that we are to deal faithfully with those who pose difficulties. In chapter 5, verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Who's raising their hand to stand at the front of the line to do this? I'll give you the list of unrulies and we'll send you in there. That's kind of like being the first ones up and out of the trenches to go across no man's land in World War I. We urge you, brethren, to admonish the unruly, to encourage the faint-hearted, to help the weak, and look what happens last of all. Take care that you be patient with everyone because the ministry that you do does not necessarily have its results instantly. And therefore, our ministry will always have to take into view the long run. The unruly to be admonished to be ruly. The faint-hearted are to be encouraged to be strong-hearted. 
The weak need help to become strong. And that means that if we are going to really involve ourselves in this kind of work, we have to be patient. We have to have our own strength. And that means there will be times when somebody needs to come to us and to encourage us. And Paul says, You are witnesses and so is God. How devoutly we behave toward you. That in the end, as we were serving the Lord, we serve the Lord by serving you. And there is a righteous conduct. Now, as I look around the room, there are only two ministers here today. So I'll talk to Pastor Roy now and to myself as well. I think it was Christianity Today, the, the one that had a new survey out. When I entered into the ministry, pastors rank number one or number two as being people who are considered to be trustworthy. Now, 40% of the, 47% of the people say that's as good as it's going to get. So the person that's really trustworthy is up there on high, and I've known this for a long time, it's the nurse. So be nice to nurses. Tell them anything and everything because they are trustworthy. Tell them before you tell your pastor. And I say that only with tongue in cheek. But I, I say this to point out the importance and the value of righteous living. We have been influenced by modern philosophy that religion is reduced to a matter of feeling. If it feels good, it's from God. If it doesn't feel good, it's not from God. And there is hardly a verse in the Bible that could ever support that. And this is why and I've encouraged you and I encourage you to continue. Notice when our political leaders talk about the freedom of worship. That's different from the freedom of religion. The freedom of worship is how you put your worship service together, with or without drums. The freedom of religion is not only includes worship, but also the Christian walk outside of these doors. And we are called upon to do right according to God's laws. Verse 1, chapter 4. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do, that you excel still more. Notice what a great letter to write. In 5.11, he says, Encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. Here, he encourage, encourages them to pay attention to the instruction as how you ought to walk and please God, and you actually are doing this. But notice the doing of that which is right. It calls for the commitment of the mind. This morning we spoke of the renewal, the renewing work of the Holy Spirit, but that renewing work of the Holy Spirit also calls us to being committed to the renewing of the mind so that we will not be conformed to this world, but we will be transformed. And that calls for us to be thinking people. It calls for us to be biblically, theologically, and philosophically informed. It doesn't mean that we all walk out with the knowledge in philosophy or theology of a PhD. It does mean that we are at least becoming as well informed as we can be given the circumstances. And particularly to be men and women of the word. Finally then, brethren, we request and we exhort you in the Lord Jesus that just as you received from us, notice, just as, so then, just as you have received from us, so then you ought to do. Notice that that is a moral imperative. This is what you ought to do. And notice that the doing is in the living, and in living in such a way that we are pleasing God. And notice, no matter where we are, 
in our progress and our growth in understanding the walk and in implementing the instructions for the walk, there is always room to excel. It's been several years back now, but one of the statements that were floating around, it's impossible to strive for perfection, but it's not impossible to strive for excellence. Now, you can do something with that, maybe even throw it away. But notice we still should strive for excellence. Excellence in our Christian walk. Oh, well, I'm better than the next guy. Oh, well, I'm better than I was three weeks ago. So I'm pretty satisfied right where I am. Notice that there is still always room for more growth. And so we need to encourage one another to continue to excel. This is what he's doing. We request and we exhort you. It's not that you're unruly, because you're not. It's not that you're weak. It's not that you're discouraged. You're strong. You're encouraged. Continue in this way and continue to excel. And that is the part that fits into the category of righteous conduct. And I have put the third one, the second idea, rather, of righteous conduct, in doing right for the greater good, that it is mandatory. For in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Paul says, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Notice, it is forbidden to be vengeful. It is forbidden to hold the grudge and have that grudge become the dynamic for revenge. There's a difference between being vengeful and being just. Vengeful says, you've done harm to me, I'm doing harm to you. And when you get harmed, I'm going to be happy. And I'm going to be doubly happy because I'm the one who has inflicted the harm. And we are not to inflict harm for harm. But notice we should always seek after that which is good. Bypass the vengeful spirit. It only twists our minds and our souls. Name the person that you know who is vengeful, who is still waiting to get even, and has the joy of the Lord. If you can find somebody like that, I'm going to find you somebody that needs a psychiatrist because there is a split personality. Instead, even to the extent that harmful conduct is forbidden, doing good to one another is mandatory but always seek after that which is good for one another. And notice it is not just the body of believers. It goes beyond that. And doing good to all. Not just the brothers and the sisters, but to everyone who comes into our sphere of influence. Whether the influence is large or whether the influence is small, influence is still influence and goodness can still be done. We have spoken then of devout conduct. We have spoken of righteous conduct. Now, Paul steps back and he evaluates. And he says, this that is devout and this that is righteous is also blameless. The first two are attributes. This one is a statement of evaluation. You are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Notice that Paul is saying that he and his associates cannot be justly accused. And this is a part of walking in the footsteps 
of a mature believer because they are walking in the footsteps of Christ and no valid accusation can be brought against them with respect to their devotion to the Lord and their devotion to serving the Lord and their devotion to serving the people of the Lord. And they cannot be accused with respect to their righteous conduct because Paul knows his inner life, he knows his conduct to be able to state with honesty, not necessarily bragging, but with honesty, that they have lived blamelessly in the presence of these believers. They have conformed to the appropriate standards of Christian conduct. There is a proper conduct between the self and the Lord. There is a proper conduct between the self and the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And there is a proper conduct with those who are not brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Paul says, we have conformed to the standards. We are blameless. Our devotion is what it ought to be. Our practical righteousness is what it ought to be. And these standards will be open to scrutiny. What I always get a laugh at is when you hear people say, oh, there's, there are just so many hypocrites. And what a, what a phony story. Because a hypocrite is exactly like a counterfeit dollar bill. Or let's even put it higher. It's like a counterfeit hundred dollar bill. How many people do you know who would find a counterfeit hundred dollar bill, would turn it in and say this is counterfeit? Or they would say, I'm going to spend it. You see, the hypocrite recognizes the value of the real thing. For whatever reason, wants to take a shortcut. But still in all, there can be no hypocrisy without the real thing. Somewhere, if there's a hypocrite, there is a sincere person. And why somebody would walk away from the hypocrisy and avoid the sincerity is beyond me. And the one who knows both our conduct, our standards should be open to scrutiny, God's scrutiny. You are witnesses and so is God. You are witnesses because we were in your presence, we were in your company. You have seen us up close and personal. But just as we have been approved by God, so we read in the fourth verse, to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. This is the one who knows both our conduct and our motives. The Christian walk is concerned with values. From values come motives. From motives come conduct. And this should be a consistent line from the very core being of our souls to the expression in public. And God knows both of our conduct and our motives and our values. And Paul can say, God is my witness that my motives are pure, that my values are what they ought to be. And what you see in my conduct represents accurately what is in my heart. And we should be able to call God to be our witness on our behalf. And notice there is human scrutiny as well. You are witnesses and so is God. And you as witness, you are able to agree with my statement of devotion with my statement of righteousness. And we should be able to call our fellow workers to bear, to bear witness on our behalf. Because from time to time, it's necessary. But even if it's never necessary, 
we should live our lives in such a way that those who know us best can best give us a good report. And the one who knows us the best of all, we can with confidence say, with God as my witness, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is what I'm all about. In 1 Thessalonians 4.1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. It seems to me that the instructions that were given to that first early congregation are instructions that belong to you and to me as well. They're applicable. And we should always be committed to live our lives in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. There is true freedom. Take a look around the room. Count the number of people. This, isn't act, this is not exactly the gathering of a megachurch. So this will make my point all the, all the more easy. Count all the people here. And now say to yourself, self, I am responsible to be pleasing to each one of these people by their standards. How long do you think it will take before you lose your sanity? Because if I try to be pleasing to this person, I'm probably going to be displeasing to that person. And because I'm displeasing to both, this third one out here has seen how inept I am, and now I'm displeasing to him because I'm displeasing to these other two people. Pretty soon, you can't even carry on a coherent conversation with yourself. And if you can't do that, you're in real trouble. But to know that I am responsible to the Lord and to the Lord only, and when I live for him, I will do my best to be pleasing to others but I cannot be pleasing to others at the expense of being pleasing to the Lord. And so this is why we should be committed to live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. I suppose as all fads come and go, the bracelet of what would Jesus do may be on the way out. Now it may be a fad only in that it is some kind of a bracelet, but the question is one that should remain. If we are required to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, then we're required to say, where would he walk? What would he do? And secondly, we should never rest on our laurels. We should be committed to excelling all the more. Just as you do actually walk, and I can see a reader sit back and say, oh, the Apostle Paul says I'm doing just what I'm supposed to do. And then he looks down at the text again only to see Paul say, I want you to continue to excel. No matter where we are in our Christian walk, in our Christian growth, it's good to look back. Let's do this. Take a look at your life as best you can when you first became a Christian. Now, study this real hard. Put down a piece of paper and say, when I was the first, first became a Christian, this is what I knew, this is what I believed, and this is how I lived. Now, today, and say, this is who I am today. This is what I know, this is what I believe, and this is how I live. Do you think that you could possibly have a discussion with yourself, if not a debate? I should think that for walking with the Lord for a long time, some of those early stage beliefs have given away to something that's more accurate. That our understanding of the Christian walk as it was then, and what we understand it to be now, should probably be a little more competent than it was then. When I became a Christian, I was just a little guy. 
but I knew that Jesus had forgiven me. And I knew that I was supposed to live for Jesus. But I really had to rely on my grandmother to tell me what that meant. And my grandmother and I had a big, big difference in terms of this matter of eternal security. And we argued over it all out of love and fun. But one of the last times I ever spoke to her, I goaded her a bit, and we got on it. And I finally said, Mamma, after all of these years, a little over 20 years now, you've been worried about losing your salvation. Name the time that you lost it. And she sat up in her wheelchair. She got that sly grin on her face. And the next thing I know, we were talking about the weather. Now, the point to me was, she even changed. And the point to me was that somewhere along the line, while that may still be a debate, I think I've moved to the more biblically supported side. But that's for today. And we all. Put down what you understand about the Trinity. Put down what you understand about Jesus Christ as truly God, truly man. I bet we can still learn a little bit more. So we need to excel, first in our understanding of the faith, secondly in the application of the faith, and thirdly in applying that application. So let's recommit ourselves to encouraging one another to speak to the unruly, to be patient, and to continue to excel. Because what that tells me simply is this. He who has begun the good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the life that you've given to us. Thank you for the lifestyle that you've given to us. And may we be able to say of ourselves that you are witness to the sincerity, the truthfulness, the accuracy of the devotion, and to the integrity of our righteousness. We are righteous in Christ, but we still need to grow in a righteous walk. And we trust in you who have begun the good work in us to continue to do so until we can hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. In Christ's name we pray, amen.